My friends at work know I have a sixth sense. It all started when I was a kid. I was very curious one day to understand what does hot or cold really mean. I went to my father, to my mother, to my brother and to my sisters and asked them, how does it really work? It took years until I really got it. This might surprise you. It's not a question of feelings. It's all about numbers. You see, it's about 10% difference in how fast the molecules move between the steaming hot chocolate and the ice pop. But what I've learned from that is that in order to understand nature deeply, you have to pay close attention to the numbers. The kid in me was finally happy. But by then, I became interested in knowing more, trying to understand, for example, how does molecules moving around in your body do something so miraculous as enabling you to be able to see, to hear? How does eating your morning cereal give you the energy in order to be able to do something just like smiling right now? Sorry, I meant right now. <laughs> so today, I'd like to share with you how in order to understand the magic of life, we have to look at the numbers. Now, if you want to understand ourselves, you have to walk into the world of molecular biology. It's a world of great promise. When we're trying to prevent cancer, it's all about trying to understand and stop mutations that happen in this molecular world. And it's not only about preventing disease. In the next 15 years, there's going to be a billion more people to feed on planet Earth. We scientists want to recreate the success of the Green Revolution. It happened in the 1960s and 1970s and tripled the yields of corn, of wheat, of rice. Molecular biology has the capability to, un to enable us to recreate that success without, of course, needing to cut down all of our forests in order to make more fields. But we have a big problem in this world of tiny things. You see, we do not understand ourselves well enough. Trying to work in molecular biology could feel like you're working in this very strange world. And what do we usually do when we're in a new environment? We try to rely on our intuition, right? But our intuition can often fail us. It's a very difficult and strange world. Let me give you an example. What are we made of? We're made of cells, right? But what kind of cells? Is it mostly muscle cells, skin cells? Well, if you do the counting, and we scientists love to count, you find that about 70% of the cells in my body are red blood cells. And not only me, also you. But most of the cells in our body are not actually our human cells. Bacteria are about 100 times smaller than even the relatively tiny red blood cells. And so in each one of us, there's about twofold more bacteria than human cells. We scientists still try to find out exactly by how much are we outnumbered but we already understand that you should probably care. Why is that? Because there's now an explosion of research showing, for example, that the bacteria in your cells, in your body, could have a strong the effect, effect on whether you be lean or overweight. And I'm telling you that example because it shows how our intuition could mislead us 
even about our very own body. So what could help us try to understand this better? I like to think about it with an analogy. Let's think of an alien arriving at planet Earth and wanting to understand our society better. It could decide, for example, to read our constitution. But would that give insight into how our daily lives actually work? Probably no. So what book would you recommend that the alien reads in order to understand our daily lives? Any suggestions? Maybe the newspaper? Bible. Maybe the Bible? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> well, I suggest our alien reads the report of the Bureau of Statistics. You see, numbers in that report would tell the alien when are we expected to get married? How many kids we will probably have? And what will we die of in the end? It would also say, how many hours does it take us to commute to work? How many hours are we spending watching TV? And what do we like to eat while we're doing all that? So in the past seven years, I'm on a mission. I'm trying to build the report of the Bureau of Statistics of Molecular Biology. It all started when I was still a, a postgraduate student at the Harvard Medical School. I was sitting together with Mike and Paul, two of the most brilliant researchers, and we were trying to play around with some cool idea that we had. It was about this fantastic machine that we have in the cells of our body, and we would we need to know how many copies does it have and how fast does it work. We were sure it was measured before, but intensive Googling did not give us the answer. Neither did the huge library. At that point, I decided I'm going to start my own little collection of bio-numbers, useful numbers in biology. And I will make it available online to anyone who's interested. I had no clue what I was getting into. You see, from that small collection that I made freely available, it turned into a database that now has thousands of entries and so more than half a million searches being done by researchers from hundreds of universities throughout the world. I can see how people go there and get some insight into why did it happen that it spread like wildfire. You see, scientists try to get meaning in this alien world we're trying to study. Bionumbers enable us to understand this world better because it gives us meaning. It shows what does it mean to be small or large, to be fast or slow, to be strong or weak. And through this meaning, we could be more effective in our research. I can already see how people wanting to make a mathematical model of cancer go and find information on how big are the cells, how fast do they divide, how quickly do mutations occur, and what is the energy source that feeds those cells. I find that through these numbers, I'm getting a sixth sense in order to be able to understand the things we're studying. But you know, a scientist, especially a biologist, saying he has a sixth sense could run into trouble with his colleagues. Imagine yourself walking around campus and saying, I have a sixth sense. How would your colleagues think about you? Well, as it turns out, I'm in good company. You see, our hero, Charles Darwin wrote in his autobiography. In later life, I wish I studied more mathematics because people with that proficiency seem to have an extra sense to understand the world. 
But you may ask, how long does it take to acquire a sixth sense? Well, the students in the course I teach at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, cell biology by the numbers, tell me they started with five senses, and by the end of the semester, they had the sixth sense. For the final assignment, they have to choose a question that interests them for their research or for life. Let me give you a few examples. One student was asking, how many molecules of the deadly toxin that's in Botox would kill you, whereas how many would solve the wrinkles on your face? Another student was asking, how many glasses of ice-cold water do I have to drink in order to lose weight? The thought being that our body will have to burn calories to heat up the water. And by that, you'll lose weight. Well, the short answer, way too much, much more than your body could safely handle. So please don't try it at home. But I think it also shows the example of how very often we find that within one hour of thinking and using the numbers to analyze problems, it could often save us months or even years of hard work in the research and experiments. Now, you can probably tell why I was happy. I saw that it was not about just transmitting knowledge. It was about giving a new perspective, a new tool in order to perceive the world. And I want to be able to give that tool also to many other people. So together with Professor Rob Phillips from Caltech, we're writing a collection of questions that we put available online, where we're starting from a question that was asked by another student in the course. How similar am I to some, in terms of my book of instructions, the DNA that's in my body, to some random person I meet on the street. Well, as it turns out, we are, and you are, about 99% identical in terms of your DNA to the person just next to you. You see, our brains are very good at detecting very, very tiny differences. And we all like to think about ourselves as very, very special. But to the alien, we're probably quite similar. We all have one nose, two eyes, two legs. We all love to talk. Numbers enable us to see those similarities better. My mentor at Harvard, Professor Mark Kirchner, once told me, trying to understand molecular biology without the numbers is like trying to understand history without knowing geography. Just like geography, gives you insight into why did history unfold the way it did. Numbers enable us to navigate in the strange terrain of molecular biology and get meaning and better understanding in the research that we're doing. I do not yet fully know the full synergy between molecular biology and numbers. But I can already see in the searches done that people are using that in order to fight against disease, in order to be able to understand better the cells in our body, both the human and the bacterial, and to find ways in order to feed more people with, keep, while keeping the health of our planet. So the next time a kid comes up to you and asks you, what are we made of? I suggest that beyond trying to help them get the best information we have, I suggest you also help that kid enjoy playing with those numbers. You are giving that kid a real advantage in our world. You're developing that kid sixth sense. Thank you.